Welcome everyone. Thank you for joining today's webinar, How to Collect and Query IoT Data with MQTT and SQL. Before we get started, uh, a little bit of housekeeping items for everyone. In, to the right of the slides, you should see a resources box. We have a copy of the presentation as a PDF that you can download, as well as a handful of links for more information on Faircom Edge and MQTT. Please do use the Q&A box to ask questions throughout. Uh, we'll make sure to save time at the end to get to as many of those as we can. And finally, when the webinar is over, a very brief survey will pop up. Um, three questions. Just rate us on our presentation, the content, the experience, uh, and let us know, you know anything that we can do to provide a better webinar in the future. You know, anything we did wrong, anything we missed, uh, we're open to all kinds of feedback. But with that said, I think we can go ahead and get started. My name is Shane Johnson. I'm running marketing here at Faircom. Uh, prior to this, I ran product marketing at MariaDB. Prior to that, product marketing at Couchbase. And way, way back, I was a Java developer and architect at Red Hat and a few other places. Uh, suffice to say, I've been around databases for, for quite a while. I'm going to cover a uh, majority of the material here today, but we're also lucky to have Mike Bowers here with us. And you know, I could go on and on about how great Mike is, but maybe I'll turn it over to you real quick to say hi to everyone. Hello, I'm Mike Bowers. I'm the Chief Architect at Faircom, and um, I'm here to support and help Shane answer any questions and um, Shane's done a great job putting this webinar together. So um, I designed um, the, the product and I'm helping, I have a team that QAs it. And um, so I'm very interested in all your feedback so we can improve the product and make it better for you. So with that, I'll turn it back over to Shane. Thanks, Mike. Uh, and you guys can consider that the gauntlet being thrown. So feel free to ask the hardest, toughest questions. That's why we have <laughs> Mike here. All right, a little bit about the agenda. Uh, I'm going to talk about MQTT for a few minutes, um, and we'll certainly kind of get into you know some concepts a little bit around the features, but this isn't necessarily a deep dive into MQTT. Uh, but certainly, if you want more of that in the future, let us know in that survey. Uh, then we'll spend a little bit more time to talk about Faircom Edge, give you a little bit of a, a product overview. Uh, kind of go through some solutions, you know, ways that it can be used and deployed, you know, how MQTT fits in there. Uh, then we'll spend a little while on persistent topics. And, and this is really where the magic is. Um, and you'll see this when we start to talk about the product overview and the architecture. And we'll conclude with a live demo, knock on wood. MQTT, you know, I thought I'd start with a little bit of a personal story here about everything being connected and this is kind of the Johnson family home over the past say decade if you will uh, early on you know it's the usual right laptops computers printer phones nothing out of the ordinary uh, then all of a sudden it's my home theater is coming to life right Xbox one is connected even the receiver is connected and then now all of our TVs you know, are connected as well then my wife wants an Apple iWatch. Um, it's connected. And then I kind of had an issue. I, I'm in California um, and it's really hot here in the summer and I've been you know, given some advice from a colleague that he had this connected irrigation system um, so I could understand what the temperature is, when it's expected to rain. Um, so of course I went and got one of those guys and put it, put it in. Then I had an obsession, uh, I'd say about two years ago, around lighting. Um, I kind of started with these whiz lights, kind of Wi-Fi lights that I can control with my phone. Um, and then I wanted TV lighting, I mean, these really cool strips that go behind the TV and you know, the corner of the walls. And so that was Philips Hue, you know, the Philips Hue bridge got put in there. Then I got on the whole Google Nest kick, right? locks, the video camera doorbell, thermostats, um, and then these kind of hubs, one in the kitchen, one in my office. Then my wife wanted a Peloton bike. They're, I don't know about you guys, but they're all the rage uh, where we are. 
and I follow suit with a treadmill that had iFit on it. Um, and these are both connected to the internet as well. But even that's just a, we're just still getting going. Right? I've been looking at a tempo, which is kind of a smart home gym. I realized you know, at Best Buy the other day, all these appliances are now connected. You can see what's inside your fridge from your phone when you're traveling. You can you know, preheat your oven when you're on your way home from work. I even found a toilet that was connected to the internet, had lighting and, and various other you know, capabilities associated with it. Um, then there's the potential for electric cars. I started looking at grills. Now these grills are connected, right? You can get out your phone and set the temperature and you know, monitor all these other aspects of it. Um, even garage door openers, right? I, I had some issues with my garage the other day and I thought I might have to get a new one. Um, they're connected and they have cameras and sensors. And you know, kind of the short of this is, is I have a, you know, a mesh network at home and I opened up the app for it and I want to say there was upwards of 50 or 60 connected devices. Uh, my mind was blown. I just hadn't realized it was happening. Uh, you know, I, I think I just assumed that my laptop and my phone, et cetera, uh, but then I realized there's literally dozens of devices in my home <laughs> that are connected to the internet. Uh, it, it's hard to imagine things that won't be. And then I just started thinking, even what I'm experiencing when I'm out and about. Um, had a way, way back, actually, I remember counting shopping carts at a store uh, they had RFID tags and sensors on them, and if you took them too far away from the store, the wheels locked, right? And you kind of had to make your way back. Uh, when I moved to San Jose, you know, the first time we went to a parking garage, it was really fascinating because there's a kind of a dashboard at the entrance that tells you how many spots are open on each floor. And sure enough, as I make my way to the garage and I'm driving around, Above each spot, there's a little light that's either green or red. Um, green if it's open, red if you know, it's occupied. Um, so I thought that was really interesting. And then we did some board traveling, and we came across parking meters where you, know, we just, you have to install an app on your phone, and you tell it what spot you're in, and you, you, know, you do your payment through a credit card. Um, or even most recently, and I, I was chatting about Mike with this when I got back from vacation, uh, we went to this place called Great Wolf Lodge, and it's kind of like a resort with an indoor water park and restaurants, and various activities. And when you check in, we're all given these wristbands, and then we use those wristbands to pay for our activities or pay for our meals, which is super convenient. I didn't have to bring my credit card and driver's license around with me everywhere I went. Or in the case of my children, we go to Chuck E. Cheese, and when I was a kid, that meant you know, putting cash in the machine and getting out these tokens. Um, you can go play games in, and then they spit out the tickets that you take to the counter later. Um, all that's gone. Uh, they, too, have these RFID wristbands when they come in, and they just wave their wrists in front of the games, and they play, and all the tickets are associated with their you know, online account, and then they get their gifts when they're done. Um, so I just thought it was, you know, if I took a moment about it, everything's connected. All kinds of devices. And then, there, of course, there's the smart you know, term, which I only listed smart city, smart farm, and smart factory. But you could probably attach any noun after that word <laughs> to describe how things are changing. And certainly, it's happening in every industry. Um, I think it, you know, MQTT itself can kind of trace its roots uh, back to oil and gas in particular. Uh, but certainly, you know, a lot in transportation, shipping and logistics, telecommunications, and I tend to get really fascinated by all things retail, but even retail, right? They're putting sensors in stores to understand, you know, the flow of traffic, where people are going with their carts, where they're pausing, where they're stopping. Uh, so this, everything's changing. It's everything we interact with is ultimately connected to the internet now. And when I think about that a little bit more, uh, for me, you know, technology is all about the data, you know, especially in this particular case. And what we really need to unlock is the ability for all these various devices to send and receive data. Or if we're talking in terms of MQTT, that means being able to publish the data. Right? So when a device is generating data, it needs to publish it somewhere. Um, or you have some devices that will take action upon receiving data. Um, so they need to subscribe to it in order to get it. And when I think about kind of the whys, you know, from a consumer point of view, I think it has a lot to do with insight and automation. 
Um, it's nice when we think about Google Nest thermostat to go back and look at a dashboard of you know the temperature of my house. You know, compare that with my electric bill uh, when we're there, when we're not. Uh, or automation. Uh, part of the reason I got that Google Nest Hub is I'm walking around the house and I can say, hey, Google, lock the doors. And she does it, right? It's amazing. Um, or, hey, Google, it's TV time. So it turns on the TV and the TV lights and the receiver and the Xbox, all that good stuff. Or from a business point of view, you know, probably lots of reasons, uh, but I think ANML is going to be a, at the heart of a lot of those. Um, if they can get all this data, then they can kind of start to improve operational efficiency or productivity, especially if I'm thinking in terms of, you know, the industrial internet or industrial IoT. Um, it could be improving the customer experience, right? I mean, part of the reason that we get a Google Nest thermostat is we assume, you know, Google's going to be analyzing that data and then can kind of start to, to stop, you know, kind of changing my temperature for me. Right? I don't have to turn it down at night or turn it down when I'm away um, or to turn it up when it gets super hot outside. Um, Google's aware of all those inputs and in taking action on my behalf. Um, and of course, all those things are really about delivering more value. You know, maybe in particular in B2C, you know, to me as the consumer. Um, the smarter Google is with managing my Nest thermostat, you know, I'm going to save money, I'm going to be comfortable, and it's not tedious. I don't have to worry about it. Right? They're delivering more value to me. Um, and this is all happening because of access to data that if we look back 10, 15, 20 years ago, would have been a, you know, stuck in a black box. But you know, as we start to talk about IoT, we have some limitations you know, around the devices. Uh, they don't have a lot of hardware. right? I understand Intel has, I don't even know what it is today, you know, 40, 50, 60 core processors, uh, I, I can promise you there's not a 60-core processor sitting inside my Google Nest, you know, lock. Uh, unreliable connections, right, especially when you're thinking, you know, maybe oil and gas or, or remote, you know, places, low bandwidth, high latency, you know, what's the impact of that? Uh, yet at the same time, you know, bi-directional communication. Uh, so I think about, you know, maybe the lights in my house, for example, um, it's probably useful um, for Philips or to know when those lights are on, when those lights are off, how much energy they're consuming. Uh, but it's also bi-directional because I can tell it, hey, turn my lights off, dim the lights, change the color. So it needs to be able to receive messages to take action as well. Uh, guaranteed delivery. Right? There are certain environments where that data can't be lost. Uh, yes, you know, sensors generate a lot of data, uh, but there might be critical you know, readings, alerts, notifications, alarms. Uh, if that message is sent, it has to be guaranteed to be received. And certainly security is going to be top of mind. Right? When I think about my home and all those dozens of devices, uh, that's certainly you know, personal size sensitive data that I don't necessarily want to be sharing with the world when I leave my home or if I left my you know, doors unlocked. Um, so I expect that data to be secure. This is where we get to MQTT. Now, it's a very lightweight protocol. So there's lots of messaging protocols out there. Uh, but you know, when we kind of think back about those constrained devices, we want one that's lightweight, right? small footprint, low resource utilization. We want something simple. Right? I mean, these, are, these devices, they just want to send and receive data. Right? Right? We don't want to add a lot of complexity into this environment. Um, it is standardized, which is why you're going to start to see MQTT everywhere. And it follows uh, a publish-subscribe approach. Right, so Kylan's published data you know, somewhere, happens to be a broker, um, and then those same clients or other clients can then subscribe to that data through that broker. So in a sense, uh, you have clients that are sending and receiving data, and you have a broker that's kind of hosting that data, if you will. Um, there's other capabilities and features in there, but it's a little bit like a middleman in that diagram below, right? Um, you have your sensor, which is kind of publishing the temperature, and then you have clients, right? It could be your phone, it could be uh, a climate control system that's you know, receiving that data, and that MQTT broker sits in the middle. It's brokering those messages. Some high-level features, and we don't have time to go into all the details here, 
Uh, but the broker, you know, one of its responsibilities is message filtering. Uh, it might be have hundreds, thousands, millions of clients uh, publishing and subscribing to data, but they're not necessarily all subscribing to the same data. Right? So it needs to be able to say that if this client just wants this particular you know, set of messages, that's all the client is going to receive. Quality service you know, touches on the, you know, the guaranteed delivery that I mentioned a little bit earlier. There's different levels uh, from, you know, far from guaranteeing, um, you know, at most, all the way to guaranteed, you know, with exactly once. Persistent sessions. Um, so understanding that, you know, clients may be, uh, for lack of a better word, ungracefully disconnected. Right? It could be powered off, there could be a network error. Um, how can we handle it when they come back on and we just want them to resume? Uh, maybe we don't want them to miss any messages that were published you know, while they were offline or disconnected. Uh, those are all in MQTT 311. Um, there's a few more there. And then certainly uh, more features came recently with MQTT 5. Um, I think some of those notable ones might be you know, user attributes, ability to insert um, kind of name value pairs in our messages to provide more metadata. Um, and shared subscriptions as well. Uh, shared subscriptions, you know, I think that the difference is that typically with MQTT, every client who subscribes to a topic receives the same messages uh, versus a shared subscription is an environment where all those clients to a topic, uh, they're kind of, think of them as round robin, right? So a message is received by only one of those clients. Uh, so it kind of spreads out a little bit. There's some other nice ones in there too. A few notes on tools. Um, you know, MQTT ecosystem is growing, uh, and I provided a link there for more. Uh, but here are some kind of standouts for me as far as clients. You can see that just about every language um, has a client available for it. There's a number of GUIs out there. Uh, we'll talk about ours here at the end with the demo with MQTT Explorer. Uh, but you can see there's you know, there's some for Android phones, there's plugins for the Chrome browser, and there's some CLIs too. Uh, these are some of the more actively maintained uh, tools, but like I said, you can go to that link and find dozens more across these categories. Um, so very easy to get started with MQTT. So that gets us to the product overview. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about Faircom Edge. And these first few slides are kind of the architecture. I'll show you how we piece this together. It starts with Faircom DB. Right? That's our database, lightweight, high performance, uh, you know, extremely optimized, portable, can run anywhere. Has SQL, as you would expect. Also has a REST API as well for HTTP access. And then on top of that, we have a set of what we refer as edge plugins. And these four in particular are essentially protocols. So it allows Faircom DB to capture data uh, via OPC UA or Siemens F7. Uh, think of these as popular protocols in the industrial space, right? Machines and equipment. Uh, these things tend to speak these protocols. Uh, so this is a way for us to capture that data in Faircom DB. MQTT, which you've talked about here, certainly talk about a little bit more. And even the ability to capture that data and then push it to ThingWorks um, in the cloud. So regardless of whether it's come through OPC UA or MQTT, uh, we can take those messages and we can push them into ThingWorks. And there's a few additional plugins. Uh, we're not going to cover these today. We'll probably cover them in a follow-up webinar. Uh, they're around t you know, automatically timestamping messages uh, performing continuous aggregation on those messages, um, and even purging the data um, so that you can kind of run out of disk space, for example. What that means is, on one hand, we can capture you know, or collect data from various machines, sensors, and connected devices, you know, whether that's some kind of you know, fabricator or temperature sensor or you know, as I said earlier, you know, my thermostat or doorbell, uh, we can capture all that data very easily. It also means, because we're built on top of Faircom DB, 
Now we can do things like build custom dashboards uh, through that REST protocol. We can even get access to all this data building our own you know, separate applications. Maybe there's an entirely different you know, web application being developed. Um, and of course, through SQL, JDBC, ODBC, you can even access data through traditional BI and reporting tools. Uh, so it's kind of end to end here. We have all these different ways to ingest this machine data and then certainly kind of new and existing ways to access it kind of outside the scope of IoT. And finally, we have web applications um, that come as part of Faircom Edge. And we'll look at both of these in the demo, MQTT Explorer as well as SQL Explorer. So this is, you know, it's a complete platform. And we're going to talk a lot about, you know, the MQTT capabilities. But the magic here is all of these things combined. It's that, yes, we have an MQTT broker, right? We can publish and subscribe to data, but we also persist it, map it to tables, make it available through SQL and through REST, um, have web UIs through MQTT Explorer and SQL Explorer. Um, that is much, much more than a traditional MQTT broker can provide. There's a number of deployment options too. Um, and, and some of this really has to do with Faircom DB being as lightweight as it is. You can prune it to you know as little as 20, 30 megs, right? You don't need much by way of memory or processor to deploy it. So all the way to the left, you can't actually just deploy it on those devices. And there's some benefits of that. Uh, one is you're not really reliant on uh, network connectivity anymore. You're continuously publishing data to yourself, in a sense. Um, you don't also worry about latency, for that matter, either. Or you can deploy it on uh, gateways. You know, so these are typically you new know, appliances that you would deploy, you know, in a retail store, or you know, on the factory floor, you know, in a gym, wherever it might be. Um, so kind of right at the edge, uh, but not on the device per se, um, or even in the cloud. You can certainly run it in the cloud. You can run, there's lots of instances, including very big instances. And this could be you know, a nice way to aggregate data across multiple locations. Um, so you might have, you know, say, hundreds of devices at a location. That data is aggregated at a gateway. And then you might have gateways in different locations you know, across the country, across the world. And then those can be aggregated further in the cloud. Um, so it's kind of up to you where you want to run Faircom Edge or where you want that MQTT broker to reside. I think the sweet spot is going to be that gateway. Um, so as I mentioned before, you can put it on the device. Right? So the device is essentially publishing messages to itself. Um, and then, of course, you know, Faircom Edge could be deployed as a gateway, and then it can actually subscribe to that device. Um, but it works really well you know, on these gateways. It's a nice way to, to do some on-premises you know, aggregation lightweight analytics, messaging handling, um, and then it can certainly push that data to the cloud, whether it's Faircom Edge in the cloud or it's Azure IoT Hub, you know, MQTT broker of your choice in the cloud. So Edge Solutions, you know, I think this is a little bit fun because we start to you know, kind of be imaginative in what we can do. So one of them is we kind of started hinted at is protocol conversion. Right, so I can capture the you know, OPC UA data uh, for a bunch of factory machines, for example, and then I can publish those to Azure IoT Hub, where we want to do something in the cloud. Um, I could get MQTT data from a whole bunch of devices. Maybe it's you know home security systems or alarms or you know exercise equipment. Capture all that data and then maybe publish it to ThingWorks um, if we want to. So we can get data in different protocols, uh, and then we can move that data elsewhere in a different protocol. You know, some examples, like I said, if this one might be a little bit more industrial IoT focus. You know, think of factory. Uh, we have various machines and centers. We get that data through those industry, you know, standard protocols, and then have it pushed to Azure IoT Hub through MQTT. And then this is kind of what I was saying with multiple location points. If you have multiple factories, you might deploy Faircom Edge at each one of those factories. Right? Maybe some factory seeds are all on OPC UA, others are still all on you know, Siemens S7, you know, somewhere a mix of the both. It doesn't make a difference to Faircom Edge. 
right? We can aggregate that data each factory. And then again, for example, um, have that data pulled into Azure IoT Hub, you know, kind of global aggregation in the cloud. Another common example is MQTT to ThingWorks. So it's not very easy to get that data into ThingWorks. Uh, and Faircom makes it really, really easy with Faircom Edge. Um, so this could also, again, you know, it could be a factory floor. It could be a retail store. right? It, it could be you know, a gym. It could be an amusement park. Uh, we're gathering all this data through MQTT right there at the edge. And then we can push it to ThingWorks for you uh, where you can work with it there. Again, you know, similar concept if we went at multiple locations, right? Multiple amusement park locations. Uh, it could be, you know, hotels, right? And each hotel has, you know, a Faircom Edge deployment that's gathering MQQ data on, uh, you know, it could be the temperature of each hotel room, whether the door is locked or unlocked. Uh, and then, of course, all that data pushed into ThingWorks. Or just is a straightforward MQTTD broker. If you're not concerned about these other protocols, uh, we can just focus exclusively on MQTT. Right? Some data are, some devices are publishing data. Some might be subscribing to it. Uh, some might be publishing and subscribing. And I think we might touch on this later. Uh, but at the same time, Faircom Edge can also subscribe to data from other MQTT brokers. Right? So you have an existing MQTT broker somewhere. Faircom Edge can essentially act as a client, subscribe to that data. Conversely, other brokers, you know, maybe you have a cloud MQTT broker, can subscribe to Faircom Edge right, to subscribe to its data. And then we get to persistent topics. Uh, we'll talk about this for a little bit, and then we'll uh, jump into our demo. But as I alluded to when we were talking about the architecture, this is where things get really interesting. Uh, and I kind of put MQTT meet you know, SQL here is traditionally MQTT brokers store messages in memory. Right? There's kind of a fixed limit there. You run out of memory, you know, you're going to have to start purging messages. If they're restarted, you know, you're obviously going to lose you know, whatever is in memory. Um, sometimes there's other you know, persistence options that, that may or may not be supported, depending on the broker you're looking at. But Faircom Edge, uh, we think in terms of persistent topics. Right, and these are stored in tables. They're stored on disk, and there's a great deal of flexibility here. Um, and I'll show you this with the demo. Is you can you know kind of store them in user-defined tables, right? You say here's my table name, here's my my column names. You can also kind of map them to existing tables. You know, if that makes sense. And we do a lot by way of JSON, so we kind of assume that the payload is a JSON document. Um, and when it's a JSON document, we can actually go a little bit farther. Um, kind of start to parse those documents, extract those properties, and then put them in different columns within our table. But you know, before I, I get a little bit farther into that, we're looking at uh, persistent topics and how we manage them. You know, Faircom Edge, after it's installed, it actually has the CT, C tree administration topic. It's kind of what it sounds like, right? It's an administration topic. Uh, publish messages to that topic to do things like create persistent topics or pause them or delete them. And what you see here is just a very simple example. Um, so that operation property, create persistent topic. Um, or if we wanted to pause it, it would be pause, you know, persistent topic. Uh, then there's the persistent topic property. That's simply your topic name. Um, so kind of the example I have here over the next few slides is I was thinking about um, a bar and bottle shop. Um, there's kind of two of them where I live that I'd like to visit. Uh, and of course, being a bottle shop, that means they have lots of lots of coolers, right? Cans and bottles of beer. Um, and I was kind of thinking about you know how how IoT would apply um, to this shop. And I thought one of the things they might want to do is kind of monitor the temperature of the cooler. Um, so I have a topic, uh, you know, a district, which could have multiple stores, um, slash store, and then a store could have multiple coolers, slash cooler, and then a status, right? This is where my messages are going to be published. And I have two simple properties here. One's the cooler ID, and one's the temperature. And you can see there's a little bit of mapping. Um, so in the JSON document, it's called cooler ID, 
but in my table, I just want it to be called ID. Um, and while it's called temperature in the JSON document, I just want my column name to be temp. Right? And I use small tiny ints here for the data. So we're gonna you know, kind of parse these JSON documents, as I said, even if they have arrays and nested objects, and deeply nested objects, uh, we can parse all that. And we can also kind of map you know, JSON types into you know, standard database types, if you will. Um, and this is kind of defined when we create our topic, uh, either through the JSON document, which I just showed you, and we'll see some more of those, or visually through the MQTT Explorer. And I'm going to show that too here in just a minute. There's a lot of optional properties. Uh, we don't have time to, to go into all of these. Uh, but I think some interesting ones are around the JSON. So if there's, you, know, you could store binary data in JSON documents. Um, even though there's not an official um, time or date type, you can store that in JSON documents, right? They're just strings, but they have a certain format. Um, so we can understand that. External broker is pretty interesting. I kind of hinted at that earlier, where you know we might be deployed as an MQTT broker, but if you have others, we can subscribe to them and pull that data in, and then persist it. You know, just like one of our own persistent topics. So I wanted to return to the field mapping because um, you probably saw there was a property in there um, at the end. And I'm going to kind of invert it and start first around the messages right, that our devices are generating. Um, so at this particular shop, um, you know, they have a cooler, you know, they have two coolers, and they're kind of you know, they're sending messages of what's our current temperature and whether the door is open or not. Um, so there's cooler ID of one, you know, 50 degrees, you know, the door is closed. Um, cooler two, it's at 45 degrees, the door is open. You know, and then there's another reading from cooler one. Um, so fairly simple messages with some sensor readings. How would I want to map that to the database? It looks like this. Um, so here's kind of that create topic message we just looked at it. But more notably here um, is that fourth property, map of properties to fields. Uh, and so we're going to say property path cooler ID. Right? It's going to match in the message. Field name is what I want it to be called within the database. Um, I could also call it cooler ID. I just change it up here. Temperature, you know, temp, and then door open. And I just called that open as my column name. Um, so if I knew that this is what my messages were going to look like, this is how I would create my persistent topic, and this is how those messages would look like under the covers. Right? I inserted those three messages behind the scenes. Those three messages were inserted as rows in this TBL cooler status table. But we can't go a little bit farther. Those are started thinking, all right, well, these, they often have pretty big coolers, uh, and there's multiple doors on those coolers. So maybe once a second, once a minute, we're going to send a message that tells us what our temperature is and what the state of each of the doors is. Right? Maybe this is a three-core, three-door cooler. Right? And any one of those doors could be open or closed at any given time. Um, and I think this is interesting because if I wanted to apply this, I might want to start looking at, you know, let's look at our purchases and see what kind of beers people buy. Right? Are there certain types or you know, certain brands that people tend to buy together. And then I might compare that against the Cessna data um, to see when my doors are open and closed because I might be able to find an optimization where maybe related beers should be behind the same door. So that instead of a person opening all three doors and, you know, letting that air out, the temperature dropping, they just open one door, get the beers they want, close the door. So there's interesting applications of this IoT data. But this is a little bit trickier. Uh, because we have an array. Um, so how would we map that? Well, it looks a bit like this. Um, and I kind of trimmed this to just you know, cut out the map of properties to fields. You still see the cooler ID, as we did before, you know, temperature, as we did before. But we kind of change it around. Um, so now we have a property path called doors. And we say there's a child table. It's called TBL door status. Um, and then we map its properties. Um, so there's door ID is going to go to this ID column. Um, door open is going to go to this open column. Now it looks a little bit like this. 
Um, so we have this message uh, that came in right at 9 a.m. Um, is 50 degrees, and then another table we see that for each of its three doors, here's their state, you know, whether they were open or closed. Now, automatically, uh, Faircom Edge is adding that primary key and timestamp um, in that first table, and it's automatically adding that foreign key. Oh, I see my little typo there. I'll have to fix that. Um, and position columns in the child table. Um, so, in the first table, ID and temp, you know, that had come from cooler ID and temperature. And in the second table, ID and open had come from, you know, door ID uh, and door open, right? So we kind of map these JSON documents into structured relational tables under the covers. And then finally, we also have store and forward. So it's kind of a, a newer feature. It's a little bit similar to persistent sessions in MQTT, uh, but also a little bit different. And for us, it means that you know, existing clients, when they reconnect, um, simply resume where they left off. Um, so if one of our coolers lost power, uh, you know, or, or maybe not lost power, but maybe one of our coolers was publishing you know, a whole bunch of messages, and maybe there was some kind of control system you know, that they could make they would respond to that, right? Raise the temperature, lower the temperature. Uh, well, the, the control system, you know, let's say it got disconnected and it lost power. Uh, the, the cooler is still setting those readings around the temperature, and they're kind of queuing up, if you will, in Faircom Edge. Now, when that you know kind of cooler controller comes back online and reconnects, it will catch up, right? So wherever it left off, it's going to get all the messages it missed while it was disconnected or offline. And then the other thing, it's kind of a little bit different, is new clients um, can choose to catch up from the oldest stored message as opposed to just the next message, right? So um, typically when an MQT client subscribes to a topic, it starts getting you know, new messages, right? The next message and so on and so on. It has no visibility to all the messages that were created before it subscribed. Uh, so with Store and Forward, that's a little bit different. Now it has the option to say, hey, I want to catch up from the oldest message you have. And there's a few properties in here these are, again, around the Create Persistence Topic message that we've been looking at. Uh, but those four bold ones are for store and forward. Certainly one is to turn it on. Uh, the other one is kind of the delivery rate. Um, so you can think, you know, if we backed up thousands of messages, uh, what's, you know, how do we want to throttle that? Right? It should be about a, you know, 100 messages a second. It should be 1,000 messages per second. Uh, new subscriber delivery mode, uh, that's what's telling you kind of about before, you know, that stored messages boat says, hey, start going, you know, as far back as we can, uh, as opposed to just start with the next one. And then max stored messages, right? We might want, want to store an infinite number of messages, but maybe at all times you want the last thousand, last 10,000, and so on. So that brings us to the demo part. And I was looking for some images last night to put here. And I really love these three because they remind me of myself. Um, if I were you, I'd probably be very anxious to get to the demo part, right? That's what I really want to see. Um, I also happen to be the type of presenter that is totally fine to, to jump in and do that demo. But I've also been the developer, and I'm sure Mike, on behalf of his engineers, is praying right now as well um, that all, all works and goes well. So I'm going to share my screen so I'm going to share my screen so hopefully everyone is seeing my screen right now so this is a a browser that I have up and running and we're looking at MQTT Explorer. Um, so localhost 8443 uh, running on my machine. I'm going to pause for just a second though in case um, something on the other side, uh, if you're not seeing the screen or it's blank or, or something unusual is happening, feel free to let me know. Um, I'll try to monitor the Q&A here for a second to see 
see if something happening. Otherwise, I'm going to assure him that the screen share is working okay for everyone. Okay. I'm going to go ahead and, and continue then because I think we're okay. So we kind of logged in here. I'm going to come to this Topics tab. And we're going to create a new topic. And I think I did district slash store slash cooler slash status. And I'm kind of going to override this a little bit and say I want it to be TBL cooler status. And then we need to add some properties. Um, so if I'm not mistaken, it's cooler ID. We'll just call it ID in the table. I'm just going to put it in a, a small int here. We'll save that. And then we'll add another one. And we'll call this temperature. But in the database column name will be temp. And I'll just do a, a tiny int here. Hopefully it never gets over 127 degrees in my beer cooler. And then we'll add another one. It's called door open. Open the database. And this could just be a bit, right? It's Boolean, um, true or false, right? On or off. So we have three properties in the messages that are going to be generated by our cooler here. And then I'm not going to change any of the defaults, but you can see that a lot of these things are already set for you. I'm going to finish. Uh, so it shows me a preview uh, of the JSON we had. Um, and of course, we have a new persistent topic created, uh, which is pretty neat. So now I can go to subscribe. And I'm going to click on this new topic that we just created. And essentially this MQT Explorer, I'm telling this as an application, this web application, to subscribe to this topic that's in Faircom Edge. And now we can go to publish. And I saved a few examples here. Make it a little bit easier for me. Say, let's publish to the status. And we'll publish some messages. This is Cooler 1. Uh, say, you know, Cooler 2 and 5 degrees. The door is open. Publish that message. We'll go back to Cooler 1. Uh, and we'll say that the temperature, you know, maybe it's gone up to 60 degrees. Uh, the door is open right now. Then we can go to that monitor tab here, and we can actually see these messages um, that I've been publishing. So this is all through MQTT. Um, so this publish, uh, this browser, um, this web application, has its own embedded MQTT client in it. Um, so every time I publish messages through here, do one more. And then the monitor is kind of going through and, and kind of subscribing and, and showing me the messages that I'm being created. Um, so pretty, pretty self-explanatory. And then we can go to this data tab right here. I'll do a refresh and we see our table cooler status table. And we see some records in this table. But I'm going to mix it up a little bit here and I'm going to delete this topic. And it's going to give me a warning because once I do delete this topic, it's going to delete the underlying table and we're going to lose you know, the messages and the data. Well, that's okay for our purposes. So we're going to go ahead and delete that. Uh, and what I have in here is the kind of the slightly more complicated example I showed you where we have nested data. And this is the kind of the JSON definition. So we're going to mix it up. Um, you can use this persistence topic UI to go ahead and create topics just as I did. 
But on this publish tab, instead of our, you know, cooler topic, we can go to that administration topic. And I can put this JSON document in here, which is going to say, hey, you know, create me a new persistence topic. Uh, we have a cooler day, we have a temperature day, but we also have this doors array. And I want those values to be in a separate table. I'm going to go ahead and publish that message. And we'll come back to topics here. Do a little refresh. Sometimes it takes a minute to show up. So here's my operation. Oops. I have one typo in here. Sorry about that. I keep forgetting this doesn't be in here. Try that one more time. Publish our message to C Tree Administration. It's published. This is my new message that I just published a minute ago. And there's my topic. It's been created. And I also have another example of uh, a message for that topic. We can do a few of these here. Go back to our publish tab. I'm going to change this to status. So this is a little bit different now, right? We have the cooler ID, we have the temperature, I have this doors array, I have three doors. And I'm trying to you know, kind of keep track of whether they're open or closed. So I'm going to go ahead and publish that message. And then if we go back to data, do a little refresh, we see our two tables. Um, so here's that message, you know, the cooler is 50 degrees. And then there's this child table. We see we have our three doors, you know, two of them are closed and one of them is open. Uh, but I'm going to publish a few more messages here. Uh, so maybe the temperature went up to 55 degrees because another door is open. Then maybe we'll do another message where now it's gone up to say 60 degrees because all three doors are open. And if we go in here, Take a second for all that to check my monitoring tab here. So we have you know, our messages coming. They're being persisted. The other nice thing I had mentioned before is the SQL part. So I'm going to kind of refresh my connection here. And if I go in admin and I go in tables, you'll see our two tables. Um, here's cooler status as well as our, as well as our door status. Um, so, you know, at a high level, it's just MQTT and JSON, right? Our cooler's publishing uh, MQTT messages to Faircom Edge. Those messages are JSON documents, and they contain information about the temperature and, you know, whether brewery stores are open and closed. But when we think about the, the slides I was showing much, much earlier, you know, I did say that in addition to, you know, collecting data from various devices and machines, you can also access it through SQL in BI reporting tools or, you know, HTTP and REST. Um, in this example here, it's a little bit of both because we have our SQL Explorer, which is a web app. Um, so it's kind of using the, the HTTP APIs under the covers, uh, but those are carrying SQL statements that we can send over. So we might start to do interesting, interesting things like select a ID as cooler the average temp is temp from PBL cooler status and you know, group by ID. So the average temperature is 55 degrees. So it's, to me, it's pretty interesting because you know, the, the data isn't, it isn't sitting in a black box per se, where these messages are they're somewhere, and I can subscribe or publish to them. Uh, but because they're persisted, I can interact with those messages directly as if, as if they were data you know, inserted through SQL or through a traditional application. Um, so I think that's pretty interesting. Uh, and that kind of brings us to an end of our demo here. So I will stop sharing. And hopefully everyone 
I was able to see all that stuff okay and just fine. And that brings us to the end of our presentation as well. Um, I did put some links on here. It is really easy to get started. Um, so that link will take you to the downloads for Faircom Edge. Uh, I happen to be using Windows today. Uh, there's both an installer and a zip. I would just grab the zip. You know, then you can um, unzip it. You know, double click on that Faircom.exe, uh, which is in the server directory. Simply click that link to open up MQTT Explorer, which I was just showing you a few minutes ago. Um, and then you can kind of go to the documentation and, and kind of look a little bit deeper into things I showed today. Uh, but really, it's every bit as easy as I just showed you. Right? Unzip, double click, open a link in a browser. Uh, you can start creating topics, publishing messages, monitoring messages. Um, you can even pivot over into SQL Explorer, start doing more sophisticated SQL than, than I did with my simple demo here. Uh, but with that said, um, thank you uh, for attending today. I uh, hope you, you got something out of it. Um, and like I said before, if you can, you know, feel free to fill out that survey real quick. Um, it's always nice to know, you know what we're doing well and what we can do better next time. Um, and I think uh, Mike's been on it with, with some of these questions in the background. Uh, but we have a few minutes here. So if you have any questions around Faircom, Faircom Edge, MQTT, I'm happy to take those questions. So Shane, I can um, read some of the questions that they've yeah, already submitted. Yeah, that'd be great. So Michael submitted a question on, on purging data, and he was asking about, is that garbage collection? And and shortly, the, the simple answer I would say is we are written in C and C++, so we don't have garbage collection issues. Um, there's, it's very predictable, consistent, fast performance for all of our um, built-in components. We do have a, pur a data purge function because we are collecting data from all sources, no matter whether you come in through MQTT or OPC UA or REST or SQL. And that data, we have the ability to automatically purge data at a configured rate. So if you want to say purge data over a month old or um, a year old or a day old or whatever you want to keep your data small on disk, we can do that automatically so the data doesn't grow out of control or not. We can keep the data forever. We have lots of storage. So that's, I think that's the purge feature that he's referring to. Um, another one, another question is what IoT operating systems uh, are best suited for Paracom DB at the edge? That's a really great question. It depends on what you're trying to do. Paracom can be used, Paracom Edge can be used for devices, gateways, um, servers, all kinds of hardware. We run from very small to very large. And so if you're going to be used for a gateway, then Linux or Windows is very typical um, for, for an edge gateway, which is the use case where you're going to set up a, an MQTT broker in a factory. Um, and you want to and you want to do more than just broker data, though. You want to transform data, and you want to gather data from lots of sources like OPC UA or REST and MQTT and, and other protocols. We support plugins, so you can make, support any protocol. And then um, we can deliver that data to any other protocol. Come in through MQTT, go out through OPC UA, vice versa. Come in through REST, go out through OPC UA. So we have this ability to, to send data in from one protocol to another. Um, that's really suited for a gateway, and gateways are typically running Linux in factories, but they can run Windows just fine, and we do both. But if you're running on a device, you probably want a real-time operating system, um, and there's a whole bunch out there, um, like Contiki and FreeRTOS and, and, and a whole bunch of those. We are Faircom Edge is written in C and C++ code, and it's designed to be portable. So we've ported Faircom, the core engine of Faircom Edge, which is Faircom DB, to over 80 operating systems over the last 40 years. We've been in business for 40 years. So we've supported about every OS out there for different use cases. And we can we can port Faircom Edge to any operating system that you need. So just let us know what you need to do and we'll look at your use case and, um, and we can work with you on that. Um, so we support pretty much any operating system you want for your use case. Also, Android. Android is a great platform for a lot of edge use cases, because Android runs in a lot of devices. My person, my TV is an Android TV. 
Um, and so Faircom Edge can actually run on my Android TV, <laughs> strangely enough. It's, it's, it can run on an Android phone. It can run on an Android tablet. Um, it can run on on those augmented reality glasses with an Android OS. A lot of stuff's happening in that space with Android. So just imagine walking into a store with your Android phone and having on your phone an MQTT broker, um, a REST API, and a database, and having the ability, if you allowed it, of course, um, you have to be authorized, the, you could interact with the store, with a factory, with, if you're a doctor, a hospital room, with your mobile device, your mobile device can have all this capability to be connected through all these protocols instantly on Android. Um, we're also working in the future on iOS devices as well, coming coming in the future. So that's so your mobile devices are a big edge use case. So it really depends on your use case to whether you want us on a little device operating system or you want us on a gateway or you want us on a mobile um, operating system. So that's what we're working on. Let's see, there was, um, it says, what would be the advantage and use case for Faircom DB deployed at the edge? Why would you want a database on the edge? Well, Faircom Edge is more than a database. Um, it's really, the, it, there's a lot of reasons you want a database on the edge. You want the ability to store data, query data, remotely access your data um, from anywhere. If you're authorized, of course, we have a full security and authorization. Because um, it's a little scary to have a database sitting out there that you could remote go in, go into remotely from any point over the internet. But of course, you have to be authorized and it's very secure. So with the, the, the answer I gave when I typed it up was with a simple unzip of Faircom Edge. So that's all it takes, you just unzip it. You instantly have an MQTT broker with all of its capabilities, a REST API. You have um, SQL database, and it's also a NoSQL database as well with a really cool navigational API. And then it's also got the um, connectors to a whole bunch of protocols like ThingWorks, NoPC UA, Siemens. We integrate with Siemens PLCs. And we have JSON RPC API to remote control all these features. So the key point is you unzip our Faircom Edge and you instantly have a fully integrated broker, database, connector, REST, and user interfaces like Sharon was showing, SQL Explorer, um, and MQTT Explorer, all these browser-based user interfaces, and you can build your own, because we have an app server built in, so you can add your own browser-based apps. So that gives you the ability, so the advantage of why would you want Faircom Edge? Well, because it gives you all those capabilities, all with a simple unzip, all integrated. It's not a hodgepodge of different products from different vendors, sort of half-baked. This is one unified set of tools that have been written and tested and integrated by Faircom. Um, and so this is this is Faircom technology, fully integrated, ready to go out of the box. You just unzip it and go and have all these capabilities built in. And I don't know if there's any other questions. I think that's the four questions I saw. Yes, well, and we're actually at the top of the hour here. So thank you, Mike, uh, for joining us and helping us with Q&A. Thank you um, to everyone who attended. I hope this was informative for you, and um, thank you to the demo gods for, for looking kindly upon me today. Uh, hopefully that was great for everyone as well. Uh, like I said, if you can fill out the survey, uh, let us know what we did well and what we didn't, and we'll see you next time for our next webinar. Have a great day. Bye, everyone. Thanks, Shane.